Now, was he tortured? Was Abu Bakr anhu actually going to be tortured? We know that the Meccans would make an example out of the weak and the poor. Would Abu Bakr be tortured? Yes. Who dared to torture Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr and Talha belong to Banu Tayyim. They're noble. And the nobles would be reprimanded behind the scenes. They'd be beaten and reprimanded behind the scenes. They weren't going to be publicly humiliated the way that the slaves would be humiliated, the way that the poor would be humiliated. They would humiliate them privately and try to get them to renounce the religion privately because in their tribalism, <laughs> they did not want to humiliate their tribesmen in public because they would see that as collective humiliation of the tribe. So we can only do this in private. So the idea with the noble tribes was you take your noble ones and you punish them privately. Okay? Banu Taim, small tribe, no one was willing to torture Abu Bakr and Talha. Guess who takes the challenge to torture Abu Bakr and Talha? The brother of Khadija. Nofal ibn Khuwaylid, who was known as the Lion of Quraysh, Asad of Quraysh, the brother of Khadija, radiallahu anha, who, the, who was nicknamed because of what he did to the Muslims as Shaytan Quraysh, the devil of Quraysh. So the brother of Khadija, Nufal ibn Khuwaylid, takes a rope. He ties Abu Bakr and Talha together and he beats them and tortures them in private together with one rope. And that's why they were actually called al qarinain the two tied ones, because Abu Bakr and Talha were tied together by the same rope of Nofal. Abu Bakr is the emancipator of slaves early on in Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu freed multiple slaves. And obviously the most famous one is who? Bilal radiallahu anhu. The most famous one is Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Bilal is being tortured, humiliated, being made an example of an Abyssinian black slave with absolutely no protection in a deeply tribalistic racist society. How dare you challenge Umayyah, right? I mean, Bilal radiallahu anhu is, is doing everything. Basically, it's suicidal for Bilal to become Muslim. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu goes and says, I will purchase his freedom. Umayyah radiallahu anhu who's making a, an example out of him. Abu Bakr says, how much? He says, seven, uh, seven uqiyas. And one narration, ten. Uqiyas are, that's a huge amount of money. A huge amount of money to free Bilal radiallahu anhu. So Abu Bakr says, deal. Gives him all the money, takes Bilal. As Abu Bakr is taking Bilal, Umayyah wants to throw a comment. You know, he just tor he almost tortured him to death. He literally had him under a stone, whipped, dehydrated. Bilal radiallahu anhu was barely alive. He's beaten to a bloody pulp. And as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is taking Bilal, Umayyah says, لو أعطيتني دينار. He could have given me one coin for him. He wasn't worth more than one dinar for you to, for you to take him. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, Wallahi, if you would have said only a hundred uqiyas, I would have given it to you. I would have given you everything for Bilal. <laughs> and Umar radiallahu anhu used to call Bilal our master who was freed by our master. Our master who was freed by our master. Bilal was our master, freed by our master Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, freed by uh, Abu Bakr. Abr ibn Fuhayra, freed by Abu Bakr. There are some women that were freed by Abu Bakr, female slaves that were freed by Abu Bakr. And it didn't matter what their status was or what benefit they would bring to this new Muslim community. If Abu Bakr heard that a slave had become Muslim and was being tortured for that, he takes his money and he goes and he frees them. There was one, uh, one woman by the name of Zunayra, and she was beaten to blindness for becoming Muslim. So they beat her till she lost her sight. And subhanAllah, they said, when Abu Bakr anhu went to purchase her, a blind female slave, what use is she at this point, right? They said, ma adhaba basaraha illa allata wal uzza. They said that the reason why she went blind is because of allat and al-uzza, the two idols. 
So it was her insult of religion. It was the gods that took her sight. And when they said that, she said, Wallahi, ma tadur allat wal uzza wa ma tanfa'an. She said, I swear by God, Allah and al uzza can't hurt anyone nor can they benefit anyone. This is a blind slave girl being pulled away by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And because of that, radallahu basaraha. She actually could see after that. So her sight actually came back to her. Some of these people you don't hear about. One of the female slaves that Abu Bakr had freed was, was, was a woman by the name of Lubayna, who was the slave girl of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar was not a Muslim. Umar hated Islam. And when this particular slave became Muslim, Umar beat her until he would get tired. SubhanAllah, he said, I'm not stopping beating you because I pity you. It's because I'm tired. That's the type of wrath that she experienced from Umar before he became Muslim. And that was one of the regrets of Umar, right? That he beat someone like that for becoming Muslim. And Abu Bakr is the one who freed her, purchased her freedom. SubhanAllah, think about that. Who, who would have thought at some point the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Umar, Abu Bakr and Umar become the two shaykhs of the community, inseparable. And in this early day of Islam, Abu Bakr is the one purchasing a beaten slave from Umar radiallahu anhu to free her from his cruelty. So he is, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is going out looking for if he can hear the news of any one of these slaves. And this is a religion that started with the slaves. Right? This is who Islam appealed to in the first place. The du'afa, the masakin, the weak, the downtrodden, the oppressed. This is where tawheed, the idea of monotheism really appealed because they've been brutalized in the name of those idols. And SubhanAllah, his father, who's not a Muslim yet, Abu Quhafa says to him, he says to him, oh my son, he said, people purchase slaves that are strong or healthy or have some sort of unique expertise that they can't get from anywhere else or they purchase a slave that would get everyone else in line, right? People purchase slaves for reasons. Why are you freeing these weak ones that can't even do anything for themselves? What's the point of freeing these slaves? What are these people going to do for you? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu responded, Ya Abi, inni la arju bi'itqihim ma indallah. He said, oh my father, I am seeking with their freedom what is with Allah. Guess what came down as a result of that? Surah Al-Layl, which I was reading. Ibn Abbas anhu says the consensus that Surah Al-Layl was revealed about Abu Bakr anhu. This particular moment where Abu Bakr was freeing these slaves that no one else wanted, that everyone else beat, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and people start saying like, maybe he's freeing Bilal because something happened in the past. They started to make up stories, right? Maybe, maybe there was some deal, some covenant, because it doesn't make sense. Why is Abu Bakr spending all of his money on these slaves, freeing all of these slaves? What's, you know, what are these women going to do for him? What are these men going to do for him? They have absolutely no benefit to the religion. And Allah responded to what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Inni la arju bi'itqihim ma indallah. I seek with, with, with their freedom what is with Allah. Wa ma li ahadin indahu min ni'matin tujza illa batigha'a wajhi rabbihi al-a'la wa la sawfa yarda. No one can compensate him for what he is doing. No one can compensate him for what he is doing. No one has enough money, enough power, nothing could stop Abu Bakr, could, could satisfy that craving that he had to free these people and to do this. Except for that which is with Allah, and Allah will certainly please him. Allah will certainly please him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he came into Islam, he had 40,000 dinars. By the time they made hijrah, he only had 5,000 left, and most of it went to these types of things. <laughs> this is something that the Prophet ﷺ recognized that there was something about the man's spending very early on. 
that he did not care about the implications of spending fi sabilillah. So Jabir radiallahu anhu and Abu Sa'id, they narrate that the Prophet وسلم, would spend from the wealth of Abu Bakr like he would spend from his own. Now that, that's not insulting. They had that type of a relationship. And that was an honor for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to be respected and to be loved by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in such a manner. Abu Bakr is first to believe in him from, from the men, right? And he's someone who has a unique position. He's building the community around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's using his money to build around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's financing Dar al-Arqam, everything that has to go with that. He's spending and spending and spending and spending. All of this in the da'wah is not public yet. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ has not actually publicly preached yet. This is all within small gatherings. But the Prophet ﷺ has not made the community-wide uh, call at this point. And obviously as the community is growing around the Prophet ﷺ, there's a fear that this is going to get worse. Uh, Ali anhu, and this is actually narrated by Ali, Abdullah ibn Amr, and Aisha, that, so they were around the Kaaba one day, and they started to rough up the Prophet Sallallahu They started to push him. They started to pull his clothes. Um, Uqba bin Abi Mu'eed slapped the Prophet Sallallahu So they're humiliating him. They're, 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 they're yelling at him. And they're saying to him, Anta alladhi ja'alta al-aliha ilahan wahida. You're the one who made all these idols into one God. You're that person. Mocking the religion of the Prophet Sallallahu And at this point, there's no Hamza. There's no Umar. There's no one that's really strong to go out there and support the Prophet ﷺ without getting themselves killed. All right. When the Prophet ﷺ was humiliated after getting beaten and slapped around, the Prophet ﷺ started to pray. And when Uqba bin Abi Mu'id saw, remember Uqba is the one who would put the camel guts on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. He took his, his shawl and he put it around the neck of the Prophet ﷺ and he started to choke him. The Prophet gave an order that the Sahaba don't do anything. Even if provoked, don't respond. Because ultimately what they were looking for was a brawl and then they'd have an excuse to kill them all. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ was actually, it's, it's a strategic reason too. Right? Don't, don't respond, let them instigate, let them provoke, don't respond to this. Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu could not help himself. He heard about what was happening, he came to the Haram, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he says the famous words, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجْلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّي Allah." Will you kill a man because he says his Lord is Allah? Would you really kill a man because he says his Lord is Allah? Now Abu Bakr is not going and punching or anything like that, he's trying to protect the Prophet sallallahu and he's saying, would you really kill a man? Like, what is wrong with you people? Would you really kill a man who would say that his Lord is Allah? That was enough for them to start pouncing on Abu Bakr and make an making an example of him. So they took Abu Bakr anhu, they rubbed his face in the dirt, and they dragged it in the dirt. So actually Abu Bakr anhu's face was covered, and then they punched him, punched him, punched him until Abu Bakr anhu lost consciousness. And they thought he might have died. They didn't want him to die because if you killed him, then that would be an another level of this, right? But Abu Bakr anhu was beaten to a point of unconsciousness. Some of Banu Taym who were not Muslims, they saw that Abu Bakr anhu was not moving anymore. So they went and they picked him up and they took him home radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the description of him, his face was unrecognizable because of the swelling. If you looked at Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, you would not be able to see his face or you wouldn't be able to recognize him because of the swelling. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had a very uh, sparse beard. He only had a few hairs on his face radiallahu anhu. That's the description of him. And they said that the few hairs on his, on his face were covered in blood. And he looked, I mean, he looked lifeless radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr's mother is treating him. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he wakes up and he says, Aina Rasulullah, where is the Prophet He does not even ask, where am I? What happened to me? 
No sign of a lack of consciousness. Where is the Prophet ﷺ? Where is the Messenger of Allah? They told him, relax. He said, not until I see the Prophet of Allah. So SubhanAllah, to stop him from asking about the Prophet of Allah, they had to carry him to the Prophet ﷺ. So he could see the Prophet ﷺ, embrace the Prophet ﷺ, and uh, he embraced him for a long time. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates this incident. And he, he used to cry when he'd narrate the incident. Ali radiallahu anhu would cry when he, because he remembered, he was a young boy, he couldn't do anything. Right? Ali radiallahu anhu is a nine year old, a 10 year old, he can't do anything about this. His, his whole thing, right, is, is the Prophet okay? Is Rasulullah sallallahu okay? And that becomes the theme of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's life or one extremely important element of the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that he puts the Prophet before himself in everything. But there's also that selflessness, completely putting his, you know, his life on the line, everything that would come with being a follower of the Prophet sallallahu